I don't want to alarm anyone, but in terms of the internet, we're all riding a flaming, brakeless bus down a mountain headed towards a brick wall convention held on an ancient burial ground. We're stranded afloat, a rapidly melting block of ice in shark infested waters. We've thrown a party for heavily armed hypoglycemic bikers, and we're running out of bonbons and pixie sticks. Things are, not to put too fine a point on it, bad. If preventative measures aren't taken, in just a few short years, you may no longer be able to join an online multiplayer game with your friends. Using BitTorrent to download your perfectly legal Linux distribution may become impossible for reasons that have nothing to do with court decisions. Skype and other online chat programs may become nothing more than stories told by grandparents to disbelieving grandchildren. Any internet application that requires you to directly connect to another person's computer, in short, may die. There's another possibility, one with similarly dire consequences. The possibility that ISPs may no longer be able to take on new subscribers. So if, for example, you had to move to a new house, it would be a house without the internet. And I think that we can all agree that a house without the internet can never be a home. Any free internet connection would be greedily snapped up in a Mad Maxim world where might makes right and people would inexplicably wear spiked football pads while riding around in machine gun equipped dune buggies, which would admittedly be pretty great, but it wouldn't help you research your term paper, would it? The problem began way back when they were designing the internet. You see, the people who came up with the internet were geeks, unused to the idea of anyone caring about anything they did. And at first, the internet was pretty lame. It was used mainly to share scientific data between large universities and government agencies, and was generally the sort of thing that would get you shoved into a locker if you told anyone. So of course, they assumed no one would really care, and they came up with the Internet Protocol version 4. This addressing system would allow for a few billion internet addresses. Then, owing largely to humanity's inability to think more than 30 minutes in the future, they squandered scads of those addresses by giving them away to big businesses and private practices that didn't really need them at all, which was fine at first. Then, a few decades later, everyone in the world decided they needed a way to access funny cat pictures from their home computers and laptops and cell phones and the remaining addresses started to dwindle fast. Now it's today, and the IPv4 address system is running on fumes. In fact, the IANA, the organization responsible for distributing IP addresses, passed out the last IPv4 addresses to regional distributors way back in 2011. Let me put this into perspective. The number of grains of sand in this jar represent the number of available IPv4 addresses. There's a lot of grains of sand in this jar. The problem is, the number of grains of sand in this jar represent the number of devices that want to connect to the internet now. We clearly have a problem. Luckily, we also have a solution, and that solution is Internet Protocol version 6, or IPv6. So if the number of grains of sand in this jar represent the number of IPv4 addresses, the number of IPv6 addresses are this. Created way back in the late 90s, IPv6 is the, is the solution to the we're totally going to run out of IP addresses and all of modern society will crumble around us as we weep and gnash our teeth problem. The main difference between IPv4 and IPv6 is size. IPv4 addresses are 32 bits long, while IPv6 addresses are 128 bits long. The important thing to realize here is that each additional bit in an address space doubles the number of possible addresses. So going from 32 to 128 bits should keep us in valid addresses until the heat death of the universe, give or take a year or two. By this point, you've seen IPv4 addresses, which look like this. Now an IPv6 address looks like this. It's a bit more complex looking, isn't it? IPv6 addresses are made up of eight groups of hexadecimal characters. Hexadecimal is simply a method of shortening 16 ones and zeros down to four characters. So the eight hexadecimal groups of this IP address represent 128 ones and zeros, making an IP address 128 bits long. Now this IPv6 address here doesn't really look fit for human use, does it? 
Fortunately, there are ways to shorten and abbreviate IPv6 addresses to make them slightly easier to remember. First off, you can get rid of any leading zeros from each segment, like so. Second, you can replace contiguous groups of zeros with a double colon, like so. Now, you can only have one double colon in an address, but it can cover as many groups of contiguous zeros as there are. If there's a gap between the groups of zeros, though, you're out of luck for the second group. The third way to make IPv6 addresses easy to remember is to maybe see if your local community college offers memory classes or something, because you can't make them any simpler than that. I did say that shortening the addresses only made them slightly easier to remember. Fortunately, IPv6 addressing is largely automated, so the occasion when you'll have to remember one will be rare. Now, if IPv6 is the wave of the future, or indeed the wave of the present, then why do we spend so much time talking about IPv4 addressing? Well, despite the fact that we have basically run out of IPv4 addresses, less than 2% of internet traffic today uses IPv6. That figure is rising. It was only 0.3% at the beginning of 2011. Still, that's a rise only in the same sense that an anthill is a mountain, so we've still got a long, painful road ahead of us.